Please come to order. Good morning. Welcome to the Commissioner of St. Mary's County meeting this day, Tuesday, August 30th, 2022. I am Randy Guy, President of Commissioner of St. Mary's County. I'd like to introduce the other commissioners sitting to my right. Representing the first commissioner district, which includes Bridge, Piney Point, St. George's Island, Mr. Eric Colvin. Good morning. Representing the second commissioner district, which includes Leonardtown, Hollywood, Mr. Mike Hewitt. Good morning. Sitting to my left, representing the third commissioner district, which includes Charlotte Hall, 7th District, Golden Beach, and McCannisville, and John O'Connor. Good morning. Representing the fourth commissioner district, which includes Lexington Park, some of California, Great Mills, and some of Hollywood, Mr. Todd Morgan. David Weiskopf is our interim uh, county administrator, sitting at the table to my left. Morning. Alisa Cassis, our communications director, sitting at the table to my right. Good morning. Amy Carter, our video uh, media producer, is behind the glass. Please turn your cell phones off or on vibrate. When you come to the uh, presenter's table, please come approach by coming down the center aisle. And remember, this meeting is being televised, so you need to speak clearly and directly into the microphone for recording purposes. I'd like everybody to please stand. We have the invocation and pledge by uh, Commissioner O'Connor today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for yesterday, and we thank you for the days that you'll bless us with ahead of us. I pray, Lord, that when those are faced with uh, two decisions, a fork in the road, that you give them the will to, to go straight and make the best decision that is possible rather than the two other outcomes that they may feel that they're faced with. I pray that you build a hedge around all of us, protect us, and lead us in the right direction. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Mm. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Commissioner O'Connor. Please seat. Now we have a couple of proclamations. Mr. Uh, President. Yes. Um, oh, the agenda. Okay. Yes, sir. Consent agenda, please. Yes, uh, I move to approve the consent agenda, which contains the minutes of August 23rd, 2022, as presented. Second. Our first, second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Ayes have. Thank you. Uh, now we have a couple of proclamations. Uh, National Recovery Month is first. And I think. Uh, Get that, so we'll move it up front here. I think you got Dr. Brucer, our health officer, and uh, Jessica Hall. Yeah, let's get everyone to come on. <laughs> okay, ladies, you're all in the yep. middle here. Yep. We'll just May as well sit in the back. <laughs> yeah. Oh, goodness. Recovery Month works to promote and support new evidence-based treatment and recovery practices, the emergence of a strong and proud recovery community, and the dedication of service providers and community members across the nation who make recovery in all its forms possible. And whereas this observance celebrates the millions of Americans who are in recovery from mental and substance use disorders, reminding us that treatment is effective and that people can and do recover, and whereas Recovery Month also highlights the achievements of individuals who have reclaimed their lives in long-term recovery and honors the treatment and recovery service providers who make recovery possible. Recovery Month also promotes the message that recovery in all its forms is possible and encourages citizens to take action to help expand the availability of prevention, treatment, and recovery services for those in need. And whereas since 1999 or 1998, Recovery Month has inspired millions of people to raise awareness about mental and substance use disorders, share their stories, stories of recovery and encourage others who are still in need of service and support. And whereas Recovery Month serves to help reduce the stigma and misconceptions that cloud public understanding of mental and substance use disorders, potentially discouraging others from seeking help. Now, therefore, we, the commissioners of St. Mary's County, do hereby proclaim the month of September Recovery Month and invite community, invite the community, namely our treatment and recovery support provider, St. Mary's County Health Department's Behavioral Health Division, Pyramid Walden's Beacon of Hope Recovery Center and The Cove, Project Chesapeake, Outlook Recovery, Maryland Coalition of Families, On Our Own of St. Mary's, and all the private community providers to celebrate the strength and achievement of those currently in recovery and those who have come through recovery this date, August 30th, 2022. Uh, 
Uh, we would just like to thank our uh, partners and our community for all they do in regards to recovery. Um, recovery month is really important for those who are in recovery and to spread the message that behavioral health is essential to our community. Excellent. Thank you. Anyone else? <laughs> Very good. Thank, Thank you, you all. Let's see if we can get a All right. Can you open that? Let me see if I can get it. National Suicide Prevention Month. Dr. Brewster again and Amy Barnes. Uh, I'll get up here. I'd like less, less people. <laughs> I'll get you. Yep, you go, you go, sorry about that. There you go. It's the proclamation shuffle. <laughs> the proclamation shuffle. That's it. Whereas suicide remains the 12th leading cause of deaths in the United States, the third leading cause of death among individuals ages 10 to 34, and over 45,979 people died by suicide in 2020, according to the Centers for Disease, Disease Control. And whereas in 2020, 650 people died by suicide in Maryland, and suicide was the 11th leading cause of death in Maryland. And whereas over 90% of people who die by suicide have a diagnosable and treatable mental health condition, although often that condition is not recognized or treated. And whereas organizations such as the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention are dedicated to saving lives and bringing hope to those affected by suicide through research, education, advocacy, and resources for those that have lost someone to suicide or struggle. And we urge that we recognize suicide as a preventable national and state public health problem and declare suicide prevention to be a priority. Acknowledge that no single suicide prevention program or effort will be appropriate for all populations or communities. Address the disparity in access to mental health care for unrepresented groups and advocate for ending these disparities. Promote awareness that there is no single cause for suicide and that suicide most often occurs when stressors exceed the coping abilities of someone struggling with a mental health condition. Now, there Therefore, we, the commissioners of St. Mary's County, do hereby proclaim September 2022 National Suicide Prevention Month in recognition of suicide as a public health issue for which everyone has a responsibility to prevent and in support of families and individuals affected by suicide and do encourage all citizens to seek help when needed. This date, August 30th, 2022. We just want to thank um, you and the commissioner, all the commissioners, all of our um, county partners for um, the acknowledgement and ongoing support for behavioral health services in the community, including suicide prevention. Um, in the past year, we have added a suicide prevention coordinator, and that is proven to be um, successful in the community with linking quite a few individuals for services. Thank you. I just want to echo uh, Ms. Burns' comments that it really takes a whole community uh, to work towards better behavioral health and uh, suicide prevention. We, we uh, really appreciate all the work of our partners in the community and uh, the families who step forward and get help for their loved ones. I need a motion to adjourn as uh, commissioners of St. Mary's County. I move to adjourn as the commissioners of St. Mary's County and reconvene as the St. Mary's County Board of Health. Second. Uh, first, second, all in favor. 
Aye. Aye. So moved. We now have Dr. Mina Brewster, our health officer. Please uh, provide a briefing. Good morning. Good morning, commissioners. Thank Good you. Morning. Thank you for your time this morning. Okay. Uh, well, it's been a few months since we've met, uh, so there's uh, quite a few updates. I'll be providing an update on the COVID pandemic, uh, introducing the topic of the monkeypox emerging public health issue, uh, and then just touching very quickly upon uh, some updates from the health department in terms of access to care and upcoming events in September. Good. Thank you. Um, so over the past few months, uh, during the course of the summer, we have seen the emergence of uh, several uh, variants of concern. One in particular, the BA5 variant of the Omicron uh, version of the COVID vac uh, virus uh, has uh, taken over globally, essentially. Uh, and we've definitely seen a surge in cases here locally. Uh, we feel that these numbers are likely an undercount of actual cases in our community because of the use of take home antigen tests uh, that usually don't get reported. Uh, we uh, continue to experience some additional fatalities over the summer uh, related to COVID-19 uh, and uh, about 229 St. Mary's County residents at this point in time. Our community transmission uh, continues to be in the high range. And again, this uh, community transmission is a reflect, uh, reflection of how COVID is spreading in our local community and hopefully uh, should be helpful for individuals as they determine what kinds of protective actions they choose to take. Uh, our community level, which more reflects the burden on our hospital, regional hospital systems, uh, fortunately has been swinging between low and medium and currently is sitting at low. Uh, this is the BA5 variant, and you can see how it's emerged over time. It's the uh, greenish color the, at the bottom of each column. Uh, it's emerged over time to become the dominant variant uh, globally, as well as in region three uh, here in, in the US. Uh, given all of this, our local public health recommendations continue. Uh, we do recommend individuals stay up to date with their COVID vaccination, and I'll talk in a moment about what that means, uh, to wear more effective masking when they're in indoor public spaces. Um, this is especially important for our healthcare workers or other essential workers, uh, those at higher risk of severe illness and those who might be more exposed to many members of the public uh, through their work shifts, such as those working in grocery stores. Uh, we do encourage people to get tested if they're experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 and to become familiar with how to access COVID-19 treatment uh, in our community. And I'll talk about that in a moment as well. Um, being up to date, uh, there's been some, uh, some updates on vaccines, which I'll introduce in a moment, but essentially being up to date means having had completed your primary series of COVID vaccine and whichever recommended boosters uh, or whichever boosters are recommended for your age group and for the type of vaccine that you used. Uh, some updates over the past couple months, uh, we have a new- Dr. Brewster, uh, if I could interrupt you for a second. Mm -hmm. um, I saw, I've been getting, because uh, of my age, emails or calls from the health uh, saying, hey, go over and get another booster. So I went over to get another booster and they said, there's no boosters. And then when I talked to the lady who at the health department, she said that, uh, and by the way, your 4330 number doesn't, I've called that several <laughs> times, so maybe check it out. But the point was, is when I finally did get hold of somebody, they said that they weren't, uh, either didn't have enough supply or did not, I mean, I've had the booster like a year ago or however long ago that was. You, but there's second. a new booster out now, I guess. And we, we were on travel, we wanted to get it. Sure. But she told me there weren't enough people showing up to get the booster. And that, uh, I guess they do it on Tuesdays or whatever. The, can you put something out that says, uh, if we're gonna get these texts or whatever we're getting, these mm -hmm. messages saying, hey, come get a booster. Can you put out when they're available and when we should make our appointments so it can help us understand? Absolutely, yes. Thank you, Commissioner, for that feedback. And you're always welcome to call me directly if you're having trouble. No, I don't like to call you directly. I, no. I, you um, have a 4330 number there. Okay. Um, so the uh, boosters, we do have boosters available for both Moderna and Pfizer. There is a new upcoming formulation of a booster, as I'll mention in a moment, that'll come out in September. 
Uh, and so we'll have that available starting whenever it arrives um, in September. Uh, we do post all of our uh, vaccine appointments on our website and we typically okay, update do. that on a weekly basis. Right. Um, it's true, we don't have as much availability as we used to when we were running the site at the Hollywood Fire Department, uh, partly because we had to cut back on a lot of our staff uh, and uh, you know, really condense our operations for that. Uh, so there was a new vaccine announced over the summer, uh, and that is uh, Novavax, and this is a non-mRNA. This is more like a traditional vaccine uh, platform that's been used for other uh, vaccines, including hepatitis vaccine. Uh, this involves two primary doses and is approved for those in or emergency use authorized for those ages 12 and older. Uh, there's no booster recommendation for that yet. That will likely be reviewed in the future. Uh, but that is available, and we do have it available at the health department as well. Uh, there, uh, there's also, as I mentioned, Commissioner, uh, a update expected to the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines. These are the ones that most people have received in our county. Uh, the boosters for that are getting reformulated, and they're being reformulated from just being that original um, COVID strain that we dealt with when the pandemic emerged to include both the BA4 and the BA5 uh, virus strains that are currently circulating. So as I mentioned before, the BA five is what's really dominating the world right now. Uh, so these new formulations are uh, intended to account for this, uh, all the mutations that we're seeing with these new uh, virus uh, strains. So quick question, Dr. Brewster. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. That's okay, go yeah. for it. Um, I still have people reaching out to me who don't want to get the vaccine because they say it still hasn't been fully approved by the FDA. It's still under emergency use authorization. Any idea of the timeline of when that full approval would happen? Yeah, so there has been some full approval for okay. certain age groups for the Pfizer vaccine, for example. Um, okay. That's been that's the commonality and from Moderna as well. Okay. Uh, so it depends on the age group that they're in, uh, but uh, most uh, adults uh, who are seeking a fully approved, fully FDA approved vaccine, there is a vaccine available to them. Good. If you go to the next slide, please. Uh, we're continuing to distribute uh, masks, the more effective kinds, the KN95s, and uh, those are through our partnership with the public libraries. Uh, we also have them available at our testing and vaccine sites. Also new this week is that we are making pediatric KN94 masks available. Those are smaller in size for elementary um, age children primarily, or, or um, smaller faced uh, middle school and high school students. Uh, and those are also available at the libraries and through our testing and vaccine sites. Our testing, again, appointments uh, continue. We did condense operations a bit, uh, and so our PCR testing is primarily through the health hub uh, down in Lexington Park uh, and at those hours and days. Uh, we are also doing two different types of testing at the Leonardtown office. We continue to have rapid PCR testing. This is when the results are typically available within one to four hours, uh, and individuals can call that number there for an appointment for that. Uh, we also rolled out a test to treat program, uh, which I'll talk about in a moment, uh, which involves a rapid antigen test. And if they're positive, meet criteria for treatment, we will actually directly offer them treatment on the spot after a, an evaluation with our clinician. Uh, the test to treat site, uh, as I mentioned, we opened up at the Leonardtown office uh, to offer that to our community. Uh, and uh, there are other sites available as well in our community and throughout the state, and individuals can uh, seek those locations on the state health department website. We also have a link to it on our local health department website. Uh, we have three assessments that we've rolled out uh, in uh, recent months, and this is primarily as we are uh, continuing to grapple with COVID uh, during the past uh, few years of this pandemic now, and we are uh, interested in building resiliency uh, for the future uh, and better understanding the impact of the pandemic on our population. Um, so the first is the uh, assessment related to post-COVID conditions, or long COVID as some people uh, call it. Uh, we're gathering more and more scientific information that this is more common uh, than we had previously thought, uh, and that there are individuals that are struggling with symptoms uh, long 
after the resolution of their COVID infection. Uh, and so we're trying to have a better understanding of what people are dealing with, what kind of resources they might need, so we can communicate those findings to our healthcare system partners and so that they can build out the resources that our population needs to deal with this issue of long COVID. Uh, we've also, again, partnered with our uh, WellCheck partners on a behavioral health impact of the pandemic assessment, and this is so that our team has a better understanding of the mental health and substance use impact of all the stressors um, over the past uh, few years. Uh, and uh, that input from the community is really critical for us and our community partners, many of whom you saw this morning uh, during the proclamations, for them to also uh, gear up their resources to respond. Uh, lastly, uh, again, through our partnership with WellCheck, uh, we've launched a PPE assessment. Um, so uh, the uh, protective, uh, personal protective equipment that our first responders and workers in healthcare settings are utilizing. This has been critical to protecting our essential workforce uh, from uh, infections like COVID-19. We know that there were many challenges with PPE early in the pandemic across the world. Uh, we wanna have a better understanding of how locally our workforce, our critical workforce, is prepared uh, for any future threats uh, and uh, learning uh, and getting uh, feedback on their experiences during the pandemic with PPE is going to be helpful for that. Uh, next, I'll move on to the monkeypox uh, global outbreak. And if you could go to the next slide, please. Great. Um, so the, uh, and I'm sorry, I should have mentioned earlier, um, with the BA5 variant of the COVID virus, um, this is the most immune evasive variant we've been seeing. So we've been seeing a lot of reinfections, people who were sick with COVID a month ago getting reinfected again uh, with the BA5 variant because that natural immunity does not seem to be withstanding as well. Uh, to this new variant of COVID. With the getting reinfected with the same variant or with it? The, they could, they okay. could, yeah. Um, it's, it's the immune escape. Um, or they maybe they had BA4 or some other uh, variant that's been circulating. Uh, we've also seen individuals that, uh, bec you know, the vaccines are primarily intended to prevent severe illness and death related to COVID. But particularly earlier on in the pandemic, they were also effective and have been effective at decreasing the rates of infection across full vaccinated and boosted individuals. Uh, what uh, we've seen with BA5 is that the effectiveness of the vaccine for preventing infection is not as great as it was with some of the earlier variants of COVID. Um, however, the vaccination and the boostering uh, related to the vaccine has still been protective uh, in preventing severe illness and fatalities related to COVID when you look at numbers um, throughout the country. Uh, so uh, we, we still uh, see some effectiveness of those vaccines for that, uh, but certainly it's been less than what we've seen with the prior variants uh, related to um, uh, fatalities and severe illness. Um, real quick, before we move on to monkeypox, to monkey pox, um, backing up to the PPE assessment, mm -hmm. not directly related to that, but just want to brag on our residents a little bit. Um, last week, Commissioner Morgan and I were at the RSVP volunteer recognition ceremony, and we sat with two women who very early on in COVID mobilized and started sewing masks. Amazing. And the one woman said, that she only sewed 700 masks. And we're like, well, we'll give you a pass. <laughs> and then the other woman sewed over 3,000 masks oh. by herself. That's incredible. And, uh, it, was, it was pretty impressive. Yeah, it was pretty absolutely. Cool. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, our, our community, um, just reflecting back as we did at our partner event, uh, has, has really pulled together in so many different ways um, during the past few years. Yep. Thank you. Uh, so again, uh, reverting now to monkeypox, uh, just to give a brief uh, introduction on this uh, for those who are watching. Commissioners, I know you may have some information already on this. Um, so monkeypox is not a uh, new virus to us. Um, it's one that the world uh, is familiar with or has discovered previously. We've actually seen a rising number of cases of monkeypox over the past 20 years or so. Um, as, uh, you know, as indicated, you know, there was an outbreak in 2003 uh, in, in the U.S. With, of monkeypox as well. Uh, what we uh, have known is that there's two different groups or clades of monkeypox, and uh, historically their fatality rates have been fairly high. So this is based on prior data, uh, the clade one of historic uh, fatality rate up to 10% and the other with um, up to 1%. 
Um, since the emergence of the uh, of monkeypox more globally, this current outbreak uh, that we've been having for about uh, three months now, uh, the world is experiencing nearly 50,000 uh, monkeypox infections currently. Uh, affecting uh, many, many countries uh, and uh, 15 deaths. In the U.S. in particular, all 50 states are now impacted uh, by monkeypox cases. This lists the numbers of cases currently confirmed um, in our region, uh, including our border areas. Uh, we do have one case uh, in St. Mary's County uh, that's been in a St. Mary's County resident that was identified. Uh, we have now documented community spread. This is not just linked to people traveling and being exposed when they've been to a place where there's monkeypox. We are seeing the passage of the monkeypox virus across populations in communities. Uh, this is how the U.S. cases emerged over time. As you can see, it, it, we started noticing or started identifying in about mid-May, uh, and it really uh, emerged out uh, very quickly uh, and, and continues to go. At this point in time, at the U.S. levels, we're seeing a little bit of a plateau, uh, and uh, we're hoping that this continues or continues or will decrease uh, so that we start to see a, a turn uh, in this outbreak. Uh, in Maryland, um, similarly, we're seeing, we saw a very rapid rise um, of cases, primarily in late July through August, uh, and we're seeing a little bit of a leveling off now in Maryland cases. Dr. Bruce, are those cases regionalized? Uh, you said we had one. Mm -hmm. It appears there's like 475 here. Is there any places in particular that are yeah, more so susceptible? As we would expect, and as we've seen with a lot of infectious diseases, that it's going to be the more densely populated areas. Um, so we've seen a lot of cases in the uh, D.C. capital region and the Baltimore region as well. Um, the state uh, health department just launched a monkeypox dashboard, I think just a couple days ago, uh, and they identify the distribution of cases across the state. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm going to go through what's typical for monkeypox and then talk a little bit about how things are different now with this outbreak. Typically for monkeypox, you have these flu-like symptoms that occur for a handful of days, and then it moves into a rash that involves um, a variety of blisters, and that goes through and covers most of the body. Um, the rash, uh, these are some pictures of what the rash could look like. These are skin lesions uh, that are part of the rash. They start flat, they become into bumps, they fill with clear fluid, then pus. They break open, they crust, and then they scab over, and the scabs fall off um, to reveal healing tissue underneath. It looks like a normal pimple. It, it could look like a, a pimple, sure. They could be a lot more or red or bigger. Uh, but yes, it's the same kind of thought, uh, although you'll see uh, it takes a little longer. So usually it takes about two to four weeks. Uh, the same size as a pimple, larger? Um, it could be the size of a pimple. It could be larger as well, maybe half a centimeter or a centimeter big. Um, what we have seen with this outbreak is some atypical symptoms. Some people are not experiencing those flu-like symptoms in the beginning, or they might have them concurrent with their rash. Uh, and we've also been seeing some of the symptoms of proctitis, the rectal uh, pain, bleeding, and discharge uh, that might come along with uh, the infection. Uh, we've also seen that these in skin lesions might not cover the whole body, as we have typically seen in some of the pictures on the news, uh, that they may only occur in certain regions or in isolated regions of the body, and there may only be one or a few of them. Transmission, this is where the, we are continually learning, uh, and uh, in, as this outbreak was emerging, uh, we primarily understood the transmission to be skin-to-skin -skin contact, actually touching the skin lesions or having contact with the fluid from the skin lesions, uh, that the fluid or skin parts um, from the skin lesions can get onto bedding and clothing and then get transferred to another person. Uh, we do know that it can be respiratory transmitted uh, or you know, from the saliva of a person. Uh, more recently, uh, we've identified that there's actual sexual transmission of this virus as well. Uh, what we don't know yet uh, that we're still looking into is whether this virus is aerosolized like COVID is. Uh, fortunately, this virus is not not nearly as contagious as what COVID has been, uh, and uh, we already have some tools uh, in the box, um, so toolbox, so to speak, uh, given our prior experience with monkeypox and its cousin, smallpox. 
The incubation uh, and infectious period, uh, typically people develop uh, symptoms one to two weeks after they've been exposed, uh, and they are infectious until all lesions have healed and the scabs have fallen off and there's healing skin underneath. Uh, and so that can be up to four weeks um, after people start with those skin lesions. Uh, what we have seen as we see with all uh, large outbreaks uh, or pandemics like the COVID pandemic is that viruses will mutate and they will mutate the more they spread across large numbers of people. And as they mutate, as we've seen with COVID, uh, their infectiousness, their uh, the disease severity, their typical characteristics may change as well. Uh, and so that, of course, is something that we're keeping a close eye on. Uh, I think a key part of the transmission in this outbreak is this, is that any person exposed to the monkeypox virus can develop monkeypox illness. Um, so that's very important to, to keep in mind. Any person exposed, um, including children, uh, including uh, women, men, uh, what we have seen with this current outbreak, at least under its current conditions, is that a, a, some of this transmission, much of this transmission is happening in certain social, uh, sexual networks, um, specifically men who have sex with multiple men um, or uh, anonymous uh, sex or sex workers or uh, sites uh, where sex is exchanged, uh, and so, uh, and, and workers at those sites. Um, tell, so, tell me, how does that square with number 25, where you talk to, through respiratory droplets or saliva or mm -hmm. contact with a rash, or just contact with clothing? 25, See, that, that That part's confusing to me, is that it almost seems like you can get it just like you can get COVID. Sure, it's not as infectious as COVID, uh, and we feel like the respiratory droplet, COVID is aerosolized, and so you know you walk into an indoor closed space like this one, and if somebody has COVID and is coughing up, then that but virus But is monkeypox the same thing? We don't know if monkeypox is aerosolized yet. Um, we, at this point <laughs> in time, the major mode of transmission in the current outbreak seems to be sexual or close skin-to-skin -skin contact. Uh, but there it is possible for it to be transmitted. It has been possible for, uh, it has been transmitted in the past um, through respiratory droplets like coughing uh, and by touching objects that have been contaminated with the skin um, okay. and right. fluid. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so as this outbreak continues on uh, and as the features of the outbreak change and as we see more community spread, uh, we think uh, that the uh, risk of exposure, of course, may be different for different uh, populations and, and may, may not stay just restricted to sexual networks at this point. And, and just to be clear, it's not restricted to sexual networks, that wasn't the right word, it's uh, predominantly affecting individuals uh, with multiple sex partners. Uh, if we go back to that, that's okay, thank you. Um, just to uh, be clear for the community as well, testing is available locally for those who have the uh, you know, concerning type skin lesions and, and uh, we offer that through the health department. Uh, there are emergency department and uh, urgent cares and some doctor's offices that are also offering that testing. And uh, treatment is typically uh, for individuals who have severe illness uh, or uh, risk of complications. Prophylaxis uh, is pre trying to prevent infection, uh, and there's three different ways we approach prophylaxis, which I'll touch on in a moment. The primary tool that we're using for prophylaxis right now is the Geneos vaccine. It's a newer vaccine that's been used for smallpox, which was monkeypox's cousin, uh, and uh, it's been uh, demonstrated through uh, various studies to be effective uh, versus the monkeypox virus as well. Uh, this one is in very, very, very limited supply, uh, extremely limited supply, uh, and is primarily at this point being mobilized for individuals who've been identified as close contacts through public health contact tracing of a monkeypox case. So a month or so ago, there was some thought that people, this won't apply to me, but people, older people who were vaccinated for smallpox years ago might have some residual protection from it. Is that still the yeah, case? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for raising that. So smallpox vaccine, and again, smallpox is the cousin of monkeypox. They, they're kind of in the same group. And so that's why a lot of the things that we have for smallpox, we've relied upon in building our toolbox for monkeypox. Uh, so uh, smallpox vaccine primarily ended around 
around 1972, I think it was, uh, because smallpox was uh, uh, declared eradicated in 1980. Uh, and uh, for those who uh, received the smallpox vaccine prior to that 1972 time, we don't, there hasn't been any boosters. We haven't had, and it's been about 50 years, right? So we haven't had boosters because smallpox was eradicated. Uh, and so there, we don't know how well that immunity is still, um, how well that immunity is there uh, in individuals who received the vaccine that long ago. Uh, the the uh, smallpox vaccine is about, um, you know, generally about 85% effective versus the monkeypox virus within three to five years. Obviously, it's been more than that three to five year time range. Uh, so there, if somebody, uh, some people still get the smallpox vaccine if they're, for example, members of the military traveling uh, to certain locations, et cetera, or for whatever reason, they may have had um, smallpox vaccine more recently. They probably have some immunity. The one who received it prior to 1972, uh, it's questionable whether that vaccination still gives them immunity now towards monkeypox. Okay. Uh, so the uh, prophylaxis, I mentioned the PEP prophylaxis, the traditional one that we're currently using. Uh, what we're about to start uh, is uh, EPEP, and that's extended uh, post-exposure prophylaxis. That extended post-exposure prophylaxis are for individuals who were likely at higher risk and exposed in the past two weeks. Uh, typically, that means uh, individual uh, men having sex with men uh, who have had multiple partners uh, or anonymous partners in the past two weeks, uh, or other community members such as sex workers uh, or others uh, with multiple uh, sexual partners in the past two weeks. We have a general page set up for our community who want to stay uh, tuned in to what's going on with monkeypox. And then we've also set up a, a page for our healthcare providers locally. We're also communicating, of course, with our local healthcare providers separately on this issue. <coughs> All right, so just wanted to wrap up by touching on some expansion and healthcare access in St. Mary's County, uh, just to give you updates on a few things that have been in development. Our school-based health centers uh, are open and enrolling. Uh, we're enrolling students and staff um, at uh, Margaret Brent Middle School and Spring Ridge Middle School. Uh, we're really excited about this. Uh, we have had um, some individuals enroll already in each of those sites, and we're eager to uh, open up services. And just as a reminder, this is not intended to replace somebody's primary care clinician. Um, their primary care home in the community is really important to maintain, but this is intended to decrease uh, interruptions to the school days uh, for our kids and to decrease time away from work for our school staff uh, by making the uh, service more convenient. And for those who do not have established primary care or solid access to primary care, this will become a source of primary care for them. Is that open daily now? Uh, yes, it, it is open daily, Monday through Friday during school hours. Okay. Uh, it's Right now it's restricted to uh, students and staff at each of the two middle schools. Uh, but as we roll it out and keep moving forward, we'll work with the school system on how um, expansive uh, that will be. Thank you. In terms of who they'll enroll. Do you have any plans to open it to the general public? Yes, absolutely, especially that Spring Ridge location first. Uh, and that's always been the plan because we know that that's a health professional shortage area in our right. community. Right. Uh, but we need to you know, get everything settled and, and move forward and, and get uh, all the credentialing happening with all the private insurers. We're waiting on a lot of credentialing with some private insurers right now. You don't right have now. a planned date yet. You're not yeah, we're hoping towards the end of the school year uh, we can start opening up. Uh, when we open up to the community, it'll be during uh, after school hours. Uh, so we don't have um, outside traffic coming on school campuses. Uh, but uh, some of this is also resource dependent, uh, so we need to make sure that we can uh, be able to hire the staff needed in order to offer those community-based hours. Um, our health hub uh, is uh, opening soon, uh, hopefully in the next few months. Uh, we've uh, already phased in a couple items. Uh, we've been doing COVID testing and vaccine, as you know, um, at the health hub. Uh, we recently uh, phased in and opened up our harm reduction program there as well. Uh, and uh, next up uh, will likely be the primary care clinic. And then as our staff uh, get on board, uh, we'll open up behavioral health crisis stabilization services. And of course, we're partnering with the sheriff's office on their day reporting program as well. Uh, that 
we have the ribbon cutting coming up and then uh, shortly after, hopefully within a month or so, we'll be able to open up doors uh, once um, all the internal renovations are uh, able to have people come inside. Uh, also new, uh, we really appreciate our partnership with the St. Mary's County Library. Uh, we've worked with them to install telehealth booths um, at both the Lexington Park Library and the Charlotte Hall Library. Uh, the, uh, these are, we're actually one of the first in the country to install um, ADA accessible telehealth booths um, through uh, our partnership uh, with TalkBox that's providing the booths. Uh, these offer a confidential uh, kind of quiet location uh, reliable internet access, uh, telehealth ready computer. Uh, a lot of individuals may not have the um, you know, quiet space or confidential space or a reliable internet uh, to take advantage of telehealth appointments. Uh, so hopefully uh, these locations at both the Lexington Park Library and Charlotte Health uh, Library will help with that. Uh, individuals can reach out to the St. Mary's Library to uh, book the telehealth booth uh, for uh, whichever telehealth appointment they have. And again, this is for individuals, you, you are getting a, a doctor's visit, maybe you have a specialist up the road, uh, perhaps uh, you have a therapist uh, that you see as well. Uh, so hopefully this will improve access to care. So who's responsible for maintaining and sanitizing them like they would anything else? Because we've had lots of conversations about um, not having people enter large congregated areas and now we're inviting sick people into congregated areas. So how does that balance out? Yeah, great question and thank you for raising that point. Um, so we will have wipes and everything inside this room for people to wipe down and uh, it's part of the library um, facility now. Um, so the cleanliness of it will line up with uh, what they normally do for their routine maintenance. Uh, telehealth appointments uh, are not just sick appointments. In fact, a lot of sick appointments are in person as well uh, for people who need actual evaluation in person. Uh, but um, a lot of uh, telehealth appointments could be routine follow-up of your diabetes, or it could be your therapy appointment for your 15-year-old, or wh whatever it might be. Uh, and this opens up that space for that. Uh, we obviously don't want um, individuals who are actively sick and coughing and so forth coming into public spaces, indoor public spaces, so thank you for raising that. Um, and I would encourage uh, those individuals who really need telehealth access for acute visits, uh, we can uh the St. Mary's Library doesn't have appointments outside of those um, open hours of their facilities, uh, but that's a good point you raise and, and that's something we should probably work on, figure out. Thank you. Okay, it's so just a couple of upcoming events in September. Uh, first, uh, we have our first um, annual uh, Walk for Recovery, again, uh, in uh, support of National Recovery Month and uh, in support of our uh, residents and their family members uh, who have uh, been on the path of recovery from substance use. Uh, so we encourage individuals to join us. It's on Saturday, September 24th in the morning in Leonardtown Square, and you can register online at that web link click, uh, at the top here. Uh, last is uh, September 29th. Um, our Healthy St. Mary's Partnership, our local health improvement coalition, uh, is hosting its annual meeting. Uh, we will try for an in-person meeting this time, and uh, that one uh, is, uh, registration will be available on healthystmarys.com for individuals who wanna come. It's a selection of speakers and topics relevant to health and wellness and important for our community, and it's a great way for individuals to uh, become aware and involved uh, in in addressing some of our local health priority issues. That's it for today, commissioners. Thank you, I'd be happy to take any questions. Are you still doing the wastewater testing? Yes, we are. We've restricted it now to just Lexington Park. Okay. Um, and uh, it's fairly it's fairly paralleled the, uh, the trend that we've been seeing in our uh, PCR cases of COVID-19. I was listening to the radio couple weeks ago and they were talking about, I think it was New York did yeah. some wastewater treatment For and polio. discovered polio. Yeah. Yes, and I didn't, uh, you know, I, I knew we had uh, limited time today and I've already gone through a lot with you, but of course um, another emerging public health issue is this uh, polio outbreak, uh, which uh, was first identified in New York uh, in July. Um, so definitely one that we're on alert around and we've been taking some early actions around to prepare for that if it becomes an issue. Um, we 
have looked into the topic of uh, assessing our wastewater for both polio and monkeypox virus. Um, should we need that in the future, that would be a, a very helpful surveillance tool. Um, we, uh, at this point in time, we don't have the resources to move in that direction. Right. Uh, we're hoping that uh, there'll be opportunities that are less expensive that become available soon. Very good. Um, just want to once say the survey was fairly simple to complete. I was able to, I checked the QR code and awesome. went through it. So I just wanted to say that was fairly easy for anybody that would like to complete the survey. It was Thank painless. You. I think it was less than three minutes. Yeah. So it was, it was, uh, I just wanted to check it out while you were here. Thank if I had you. Any questions. Thank you for doing that. And thanks for saying something. No problem. And, um, to, uh, I'm glad that the health department was here, one, for recovery month, but I think it was a uh, very, I don't know if it was happenstance that you had recovery month and suicide prevention at the same time, but uh, they go hand in hand. Yes, they do. And um, I want to, one, thank all of you for your work with the veterans groups. Um, something I didn't say earlier was you know, we lose 22 a day. Yeah. So that it's very profound, and, and working with the veterans groups are, are very important um, mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, thank you. And uh, hopefully we don't see, uh, you know, we mentioned the polio, or Commissioner yeah. Colvin did, but at one point we had eradicated all these, and then we, yeah. we look at um, decisions have consequences with uh, those that make the personal decisions for vaccines, so now that's what we're seeing is the, the rise. So, yeah. um, but thank you for your uh, constant effort on all of that and everybody Thanks, over sir. there. Thank you, and, and I pr again, um, I uh, really appreciate all your advocacy on behavioral health for our community. I know uh, you've, you've been a strong voice on that matter and we appreciate that support um, and all the efforts that we currently have in place with the health hub, uh, our behavioral health crisis stabilization are to uh, assist us as a community in both those issues of mental health and substance use recovery. Good, well thank you. Any thank other you. questions, commissioners? No? Okay, thank, thank you, you all. Dr. Bruce, thank you very much for your input. All right, I move to adjourn as the St. Mary's County Board of Health and reconvene as the commissioners of St. Mary's County. Second. I have a first and second, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any nays, ayes have. Thank you very much. Excuse me, commissioners, if I can interrupt for just a moment, I wanted to let you know that our YouTube feed is down, but we're still live on Channel 95, and we do have our IT department working on it, and if needed, we'll upload the full meeting, the recording of the full meeting later this afternoon. So I just wanted you to be aware. Thank Good. you. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you, commissioners. Okay, next we go right into uh, county administrator time. Thank you, Commissioner President Guy. And first up is the two draft agendas for uh, September 13th and September 20th. There will be no meeting next week of September 6th. So on Tuesday, September 13th, we will start at 1 p.m. here and the invocation and pledge by Commissioner Morgan. We'll have two proclamations, one for Forget-Me-Not Month and one for Hispanic Heritage Month, followed at 1.15 by the Office of the County Attorney decision for the proposed St. Mary's County transfer tax exemption, followed by County Administrator time, followed by Commissioner time, followed by closed session personnel, and then adjourn. That's the reason for the late start is the CalVex drill that morning. Next, on September 20th, you'll meet at the normal time and place, invocation and pledge by Commissioner President Guy. You'll have five proclamations. It is Constitution Week, Clean Energy Week, Underground Railroad Month, National, I'm sorry, four proclamations, National Senior Center Month, and then you'll have a presentation for the invitation to the 75th Annual St. Mary's County Fair, followed by County Administrator time and Commissioner time, and then adjourn. And first up on today's docket is the Sheriff's Office with the Equitable Sharing Agreement and Certification for Fiscal Year 2022. Interim Assistant Sheriff David Yangling and Lottie Bell presenting. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So the annual certification report before you today is a summary of the equitable sharing activity for the fiscal year ended June 30, 22. As shown on the report, there were no federally forfeited funds received or expended in FY22. Your approval is requested so the report may be submitted to the Department of Justice and the Treasury Department in accordance with the equitable sharing agreement. Captain Yingling and I are happy to answer any questions you may have. What is the equitable funds? sharing agreement for the public? Okay. 
The, equit the equitable sh sharing agreement is essentially uh, federal uh, narcotics uh, investigations where we have a, a task force officer assigned to that group. Uh, when there is a, a large federal seizure, uh, we, we get a portion of the forfeited funds. Thank you. Have you, have you received any funds that I read in here? There's been none recently? So uh, with federal investigations, obviously federal investigations take more time. They go over a, uh, uh, they're, they're going after a bigger fish, so they tend to come in in big chunks and the cases tend, tend to go on. But uh, so this is just a continuation of something we've done and we may get something or may not. We, we, we generally get uh, uh, Big chunks of money in uh, over over periods of time instead of small steady stream it, of uh, income. Yes. I move to approve the annual equitable sharing agreement and certification for FY22 from the Department of Justice, Department of Treasury, on behalf of the St. Mary's County Sheriff's Office, and authorize the Commission President to execute related documents and instruct Sheriff's Office staff to submit electronically. Second. <clears throat> I have a first and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Ayes have. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Next up from the Department of Public Works and Transportation, the STS Buses and Bus Facilities Program Funding Grant. Director Jim, Jim Gotch presenting. And Allison Swint. Good morning. 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 Okay, we're uh, asking for funding for improving the bus barn that we have over at Public Works. It, uh, it has a slab that is cracking and settling and we're trying to repair the slab. Uh, this has come up, there was a, a grant that was awarded to us in 2019. Hmm. And at that time we were looking at actually contracting the STS service out and not running it through the Department of Public Works. So we told uh, the MTA that we were returning the grant and we were not gonna be pursuing it. But when they did an audit this year, they've determined that they never closed the grant on their books. So they've come back to us and said, can you please spend the money? <laughs> and, Good idea. Uh, and so they, uh, what's happened is uh, they said if, if they return the grant to the feds that that uh, it affects their funding for future years. And they said if it affects their funding, obviously it would affect our funding as well. So uh, again, that's why they're asking us. And this spend. slab qualifies? Yes. Good. Yeah. I, move to approve, <clears throat> I move to approve the budget amendment increasing PF 2301 buses and bus facility by $156,000 reducing the FIN 23 capital reserve and authorize the Commissioner President to sign the related documents. Second. I have a first and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And next up is the Department of Finance with the Excise Tax Study Plan of Action with Ms. Jeanette Cudmore and Jody Kwasney. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Morning. morning. Good morning, commissioners. Um, so I'm gonna give you a little bit of history first before we go forward. Um, our current impact fee was approved on March 6, 2018. And that was ready for the FY 2019 budget. It was calculated at $10,446. And it was to be phased in over five years. In the 2023 budget, we currently have an impact fee of 2,175, and you're kind of thinking, what happened? What happened is that um, the change in enrollment with the Board of Education had us to recalculate the fee and actually reduce it um, because we were not um, having any uh, schools in our CIP pro program, okay? Hold, hold that thought for just yes, a second. Yes, sir. Now, when we talk about schools, we can only use this impact fee for new school construction? for um, growth related projects is how we were using the impact fee. Okay, we can't use so it new for these seats. roof replacements and these other things we- Correct, sir, for new seats. Such. Okay, great, thank That's how we were using for the, board, the impact fee. Um, so direction was given by the commissioners of St. Mary's County to perform an excise tax study to replace the current impact fee as a source of revenue. 
During the 2021 regular legislative session, HB 0528, St. Mary's County, the repeal of the impact fee, authorization of a building excise tax was adopted. The effective date of the excise tax implementation is July 1, 2023, which is the next fiscal year, FY 2024, so here we are. So with that, we um, have contracted with Teschler Bice to actually perform an excise tax <coughs> calculation for us um, because we've always just done impact fees and that's been like that for the last over maybe 30 years. This is a new calculation which will include um, other sources, maybe look at other areas. It'll also allow us to have more flexibility on how we use the money and also can probably go after and use it for um, and collect it from commercial sites. So with that, I'd like to have, we have um, Mr. Carson Bice here. He is the president of the Tischler Bice. And of course, Jody is here. And um, we'll go ahead and turn it over to uh, Carson. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, President, members of the commission. I'm, I'm Carson Bice with uh, Tischler Bice. We're based in Bethesda, Maryland and uh, Boise, Idaho. Uh, we've been in business now for over 40 years. We specialize in uh, one-time fees and exactions such as impact fees, excise taxes, water and sewer capacity fees. Uh, we also specialize in fiscal and economic impact analysis, capital improvement planning, uh, and real estate and market feasibility studies. You can see here uh, from this slide that we've done quite a bit of work uh, related to impact fees and excise taxes in the state of Maryland. Uh, we've actually done more of this kind of work than anybody in the country and certainly more uh, in the state of Maryland than, than any other firm. Uh, so it may surprise you, it surprises a lot of our clients to find out that um, <laughs> as a country, there are very limited options that we have in local government for funding infrastructure. So there's the obvious revenue sources that we have, and the, these vary from state to state depending on your, your local government revenue structures, but we have our, our general taxes, whether they be property taxes, income taxes, sales taxes, uh, and in, in the case of sales taxes, some of these have to be voter approved depending on the state. Uh, we also have impact fees, which the county County has now. Uh, we have excise taxes, which are gaining in popularity because of the flexibility, and I'll talk a little bit about that on the next slide. Uh, then we also have special authorities and taxing districts, which go under different names depending on the states. Uh, growing in popularity is the idea of public, pub, excuse me, public-private partnerships uh, to fund infrastructure. And then with our enterprise fund operations uh, that that usually include uh, water and sewer, we have rates and charges associated with uh, utility financing. So the difference between impact fees and excise taxes are, 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 are are quite different. An impact fee, uh, a fee has to be designed in order to cover the cost of a service, or in the case of impact fees, it's a much stricter requirement where we have to meet uh, three prongs of a legal test. We have to satisfy need or nexus, so through the course of the study, we have to show that growth is generating the need for facilities uh, and that we're gonna construct them in a certain time frame. Uh, we have to show benefit, and benefit is shown two ways. One is through the timing of the expenditure, and two, with impact fees, sometimes we we were forced to set up collection and expenditure zones. Uh, for instance, we recently did a school fee in South Carolina where all the growth is in the north oriented towards Charlotte. And so the fee is, is implemented there, but in the rural area of the county where there, we're not expected to build any schools, there's no fee because we can't show that benefit or meet that benefit test. And then we also have to make sure that the impact fees are proportional. So that's why you have a differential fee for single family units versus multifamily units, differential fees for retail versus office versus industrial. Uh, with excise taxes, we have a lot more flexibility. Uh, it is a tax, so by definition, it is a revenue-raising uh, mechanism. Uh, we don't have to, to meet the strict rational nexus that we have to meet with impact fees, and we have a much greater uh, flexibility in terms of what we spend the money on. So in the preamble, I, we, someone asked uh, about you know, spending on roof replacements and those sort of things. With an excise tax, you can spend that kind of money on maintenance and rehab, where with impact fees, uh, you're not allowed to. So it does offer us greater flexibility in terms of how we spend the money. So why excise taxes? Well, uh, in many communities, infrastructure capacity is essential if we want to accommodate new development, particularly economic development, uh, which is driven in large part by quality of life or quality of place. Uh, we want to continue attracting millennials and boomers and innovators into our community. Um, 
where you are experiencing rapid growth and there's a sort of a no growth sentiment in your community, uh, impact fees or excise taxes can go a long way to assuaging those feelings where if the citizenry knows that new growth is offsetting their uh, capital facility demands, they're more likely to accept that new growth versus uh, protesting uh, any new rezoning that comes through the door, so to speak. Uh, excise taxes and impact fees are also both preferable over ad hoc exactions. Uh, many communities we work with across the country that don't have excise taxes or impact fees, uh, there's, a, there's a different ask, so to speak, for each project that comes forward, and make, that makes that quite difficult for a developer to work that into their financing pro forma. So when you have a set tax schedule, uh, there is there's greater predictability uh, in terms of their revenue streams. And with excise taxes, we do have a fairly re a stable revenue stream uh, over time. So the St. Mary's County excise tax study, uh, we are proposing that we replace the three current impact fees with excise taxes, and those include parks and recreation, uh, roads, and schools, and we are proposing a, to look at a fourth category uh, called public safety. So the study process is, is fairly straightforward. Could go, sir, sir. Could, you, could you go back and define which piece of public safety you're referring to? Um, I would, I mean, we can define that as part of this discussion, as part of the process. Typically, we define public safety as, as law enforcement, uh, fire, EMS, emergency operations, emergency services. You may want to include the detention center or any sort of those types of it facilities. It could be a catch-all. It could be a catch-all, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So the, the study process is, is, is straightforward. We, the first task is project initiation and data acquisition. Uh, we then prepare what we call land use assumptions and development projections. Those are helpful to define where we are as a community in terms of levels of service. We also uh, wanna be able to project revenue going forward. So we make growth projections, both from a residential perspective as well as a non-residential perspective. Uh, we determine capital facility needs and service levels. Uh, the reason we, we do this is we've, in our experience, not only in Maryland, but in other states where excise taxes are legal, we find that the, the, the payers are much more willing to accept an excise tax if you do more of an impact fee process, so to speak, in terms of defining levels of service, so that we're just not pulling a number out of the air, like for instance, it's $2 a square foot for, for residential development. They wanna know uh, how, we're, how we're coming up with uh, the tax rate itself. Uh, as part of task four, we do that, that, that cash flow analysis where we look at projected expenditures versus the revenues that the, the tax would bring in. Uh, we prepare the draft and final excise tax report, and then we go through the public hearing process. So we'll have a continuing relationship with your company? Yes, sir. So yes, sir. And, and we- have a lot of questions for you, but- Sure, <laughs> yeah. And, and as part of our process, I mean, the, the, this is purely optional or, 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 or a decision made by, by you and staff, but you know, we will be down here on several trips and we're, we're big proponents of, of updating you through the study because there may be some forks in the road during the process that we need some direction from a policy perspective on. So I would expect to see me again for some sort of work session uh, during the middle of this process. I got process. some questions for you when you're done. Okay. Um, so some policy considerations, uh, as I just mentioned, um, you know, we, we can come to you with options for the tax structure. So for instance, uh, sort of the way that excise taxes were traditionally done was, you know, there was either a, a just a residential fee or it was there, or excuse me, a tax or a tax for a single family resident versus a multifamily resident. One of the things that we've been doing a lot of is, is doing taxes by size of units. So it would be a graduated schedule, and there's a graphic here that shows the, the linear regression analysis for, for a community, uh, this one happened to be Tucson, Arizona, where uh, the data in, in most communities we work uh, will hold out that as the house size gets larger, there are more people. So they're consuming more services, they're demanding more infrastructure. And so that's an option that you may wanna consider. Uh, other options would be the non-residential tax schedule, do we just sort of do a general non-residential category or do we, uh, you know, portion it out to retail versus office versus industrial versus warehousing versus other types of uses? 
Also, there may be infrastructure that uh, we may not be expanding, but there may have been a recent expansion, and so there's a cost recovery me me uh, mechanism. So, for instance, let's just assume that uh, uh, you know an, uh, uh, the, a detention center was built five years ago that's been oversized for new development, <coughs> and growth's going to benefit from that going forward. So, even though you've already made that expenditure, you've got debt service payments on it. So, we may want to include that in the excise tax calculation, and that's what we call a cost recovery or buy-in method. Also, with the road tax structure, uh, one of the things we've been doing a lot of is, is allocating the tax by vehicle miles of travel. And the idea here is that the further and further you get out into the into the county, your trip lengths are larger, so you're consuming more roadway. And this graphic here is, is from a county in, in, in Colorado, uh, where zone one, which is the lighter green, is, is, is the closer in area, the built up area. And so in the dark green area, the tax is different because, or greater because they're consuming more roadway going forward. And so these are the kind of policy things that, that we'll probably come back to you at at some point in order to um, uh, gauge, gauge your feedback. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you. Um, I read this over the weekend and I found it very interesting. Now. In impact fees are something I've been used to for a long time. I was on the Board of Education, and it's not about me, but I've had a lot of experience with impact fees, both on the public side of being on the Board of Education and receiving them when we were a, a school system that was growing, and we were doing a lot of new construction back in the 90s. Now, what we have now is we're having a school system that's actually been somewhat stagnant as far as growth. And what we're seeing is a, a growth in parochial. We have a King's Christian's Academy here. It's getting ready to put a big addition on. <clears throat> we're seeing an increase in um, homeschooling. So we have in this shift in our community of going away so much from growth of the public school system to a somewhat, uh, I'll call it the term stagnant. That's not a good term, but it hasn't really grown. So my point to you is it's about fairness. <clears throat> now, you talk about impact fees. I've never believed that we've been able to calculate that when someone builds a house in a subdivision that that has a, like dropping a stone in a pool of water has a ripple effect throughout the whole county where, okay, that house caused another deputy to be hired, caused another school teacher to be hired, caused another uh, county employee to be hired. So it gets to be fuzzy in my mind as to how we justify this impact fee, and I'm happy to see it go to an excise tax, because I believe <clears throat> that allows us to spread out the benefit to the public and by the way of parochial schools, because those people pay taxes too, uh, homeschoolers. And so with that said, uh, I'd like to know a couple of things here. I wrote them down. You talk about there's a benefit uh, to residences from when we have an excise tax, there's some type of a benefit that's going to come to a residential application because they're the people who are paying that excise taxes. I'm assuming that's the people because commercial doesn't pay it. Well, that's a policy decision. Right. Well, again, to, to right now the impact it's residential. Fees, right. The impact yeah. fees don't. And, and if we go forward with the same, so how do we get a resident, how do we get a benefit test you talked about. How would we know, how could people gauge what this tax is doing for me? Right, that's a, that's a big question to unpack. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess the first part of that is with, with excise tax, you don't have to meet the benefit test. With impact fees, you don't. And if what you're saying is true in, in our analysis, uh, showed that over the next 10 years that enrollment indeed was going to be stagnant, you weren't going to be building new capacity, we would be recommending against continuing with an impact fee approach because you're very vulnerable to a legal test. With an excise tax, we don't have that, that issue. And so, uh, you know, benefit is, from a tax perspective, is somewhat of a value proposition, right? Um, and I would argue that if you're 
I mean, you probably, if you're like most school districts or school systems that we work with across the country, is you do have significant infrastructure replacement needs and mm -hmm. programmatic needs. And the excise tax could go a long way to perhaps solving those, which the impact fee is not the vehicle or mechanism used to do that. Okay. You talked about new growth may be more acceptable with an excise tax. Now, what we recently saw was there's a uh, piece of property in Lexington Park that's gonna be redeveloped into a rural farms, and it's caused quite a hoopla. And what we saw last week was uh, rural farms come along and say, well, let's give everybody a little bit of money here. You know, let's give displaced restaurants some money, let's give the, so the point gets to be is that when you say excise taxes are acceptable in no growth or slow growth situations, how do you, how do you qualify that? I, I think you may have misunderstood. My, my, my observation was that, you know, generally speaking across the country, in jurisdictions where we work where there's a strong no growth sentiment, if you implement something like impact fees or excise taxes and the population now understands that a big financial burden is being offset by that new development, they're not as vocal about it typically as they are if things are being, you know, growth's occurring rampantly and, and they're not paying their own way, so to speak. Okay, maybe, maybe I didn't get it. Yeah. But it goes to my next point. You talked about a stable revenue stream and that this could be recurring funding. Now, what's been the, um, the bad, or the, the con that save impact fees is they're, they're predicated towards, uh, you know, schools, wrecks and parks and roads. And we just recently borrowed $30 million, of which $17 million is gonna go for roof replacements and other type of upgrades to our uh, aging schools. So when you talk about this recurring uh, revenue, would your company be in a position to say, hey, you guys are gonna get three million every year from this, in which case we can offset some of maybe our other taxes that we're doing, uh, whether it be property or whether it be income or uh, transfer, recordation, that this revenue stream, you could, you could qualify it as being two million a year, three million a year? Yes, yes, so that's part of what we'll do is depending on the rates that are being proposed, we'll be projecting revenue. Now, one benefit to an excise tax versus an impact fee is, um, you know, if, if we're doing what we call a plan-based impact fee study, where we're, we're saying, okay, over the next 10 years, you're gonna build facilities X, Y, and Z. By definition, we have to calculate a growth share because one of the tenets of impact fees is that we can't ask a new resident to correct an existing deficiency, right? right? With excise, excise taxes, you have a much greater flexibility. So in simple terms, let's say that your capital plan was gonna cost you $30 million. You could, through an excise tax, say, well, we wanna generate enough money to cover that $30 million, which may not have been the case with impact fees. But then we get into, well, you know, there's sort of the political um, notion of, you know, what's the what's the political threshold we're willing to accept in terms of the tax rate? Okay, good point, good point. It's whatever the pressure right. will be. And, and that's part of what we can also provide is, uh, you know, because it's becoming increasingly uh, an issue with our clients about what is the effect of the impact fee or the excise tax on, a ho on housing affordability. So as part of this, we can show two scenarios is, you know, it, it, we'd look at, you know, average, like the average house is X, the average income is, is Y, you shouldn't be spending more than 33% of your income on housing. So we can look at scenario one, which is, well, what's the burden t with today's fee structure versus what's the burden with maybe three or four options with the excise tax structure so you can see to what extent it moves the needle. And it's frankly, it's somewhat surprising because you know one of the things we hear a lot from the development community with our impact fee studies is that you know for every thousand dollars increase, you're pricing so many people out of the market. Yes. Well, we, we just did a, a school impact fee study in South Carolina where the housing burden for a single family unit, it was 25.2% of their income was going monthly to housing by adopting a $15,000 school impact fee, which is one of the highest in the country, it goes from 25.2 to 25.9%. So 
Does that sound fair? It's de minimis in terms of, yeah. you know, the argument is, is that, you know, you're going to price a third of the market out, out. Of, out of the, or a third of the residents out of the market, but really it's not even one percentage on your, your monthly expenditures. Not that that should be discounted, but, but it's, it's, it's not as, Ex sometimes it's exaggerated what the impact is. Well, so that's say, why it's, it's always about who's paying, who's writing the right. check. Right. That's right. usually what the thing is. Right. I had two quick ones and I'll let you go. Okay. You talked about a cost of recovery for past investment, i.e. debt service would be my term. Right. So what this board or the board before this inherited was a, a long term of no infrastructure, whether it had been a new jail, whether it had been a new road that had been on the books for years, there um, could have been a library, a senior center, different things that were done uh, by the political will of that, uh, who was elected at that time. So when you talk about recovering because people will say to us, look, you guys are borrowing a lot of money, but we can say boards before us for years would not do anything, and stuff wears out. Infrastructure crumbles. So when it comes time to pay or, or to upgrade, uh, it can be, so how do you see this cost recovery benefit? Do you, you see raising the impact, the excise tax to offset the additional money you're having to borrow? I mean, I, I, how, do you, how do you see that structure working? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I'm understanding the question, but how it would work is, let's just use public safety for an example. Let's, let's say that, uh, you know, if we want to maintain current levels of service in the county, we're going to need additional sheriff's office space. We're also going to need additional emergency services and fire protection space. So there could be two layers of the excise tax that's generating revenue to expand that infrastructure system. But let's say that you you issued that $15 million debt for, let's say, a detention-related facility. Well, that would be the third component of, of, of the tax, where we're recouping some portion or all of the future portion of that debt service. Does that make sense? Well, I don't know if it's fair to the new people paying the tax. That's the thing. Well, that well, that's the policy. <laughs> okay. Right? I, mean, <laughs> I can only recommend I get, certain I get, things. I get it. All right. Last question I got. How much do you cost? Uh, I think this was. It's in the nineties, ninety thousand. So you have a fixed rate. Right? Yeah. Some kind of exactly. Percentage. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I always like to know what things cost. Yeah. Sir. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So, a couple quick questions sure. from me. Pretty simple. Um. Timeline looks like about five months to do this. Okay. Mm -hmm. You go through this whole process, you come up with this calculation, it's based on all these factors you've discussed, public safety, schools, et cetera, et cetera. How long is the calculation good for? When do we come back and reevaluate what the new excise tax should yeah. be? Well, so not as frequently as impact fees. I mean, okay. impact fees, if you, you should be updating every five years to coincide with you know, your CIP, which typically, you know, is a five or six year window. Also, you want to, since it's an impact fee um, and there's more legal risk, you want to make sure that you're current with demographics, growth projections, cost factors. With an excise tax, I think you could leave it in place much longer. You know, you just need to make sure that, um, you know, maybe you peg it to, you know, some, something like the engineering news and record so that you're keeping up with construction costs. Like a CPI? Right. But engineering news and record is, is better because it's tracking construction related materials where the CPI is tracking other things. Yeah. So last thing, um, Commissioner Hewitt is very right about schools and the shift from building new to maintaining what we have. And this board obviously supports this shift from impact fees to excise tax. We helped push that through. When, but it's a complicated thing. So we see the benefits, but this is, this is complex stuff. And I think that we definitely need to have potentially multiple public hearings when the time comes. Um, we need to be able to explain this in detail and get a lot of feedback from our residents as it exactly. moves forward. So there'll be a final report that'll come forward and we'll explain it and we'll provide the details. And then at that time, yes, we can have multiple public hearings. Is there hearings. opportunities for public input in the middle of the process before it gets to that final report stage or is it better that you just come up with the recommendation? Um, 
I mean, that's, that's really a decision that's up to you. I will tell you that um, with our impact fee studies, we typically recommend, you know, two stakeholder groups with the folks that are writing the checks, so to speak, the home building mm -hmm. industry and others, uh, where we sort of introduce the topic, you know, talk about the process, get some feedback, and then the second meeting and sometimes a third meeting is needed when uh, we've got the results and, and something for, for folks to look at. I just don't want to get to the final report stage and some of these concern groups be very surprised by what right. they see. Right. So we're amenable, certainly amenable to that. And we, you know, we normally piggyback it on another trip that we're down here. So if we're down here gathering data, it's a perfect opportunity. Not only if we can time it so we can brief you on one of your days, it's also an opportunity to do a stakeholder meeting. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think when you look at the uh, impact fee versus the excise task that um, at least in my my opinion the impact fee is very niche you know you're you're looking at it from a very very finite point of view as to who is paying for the impact of development whether it's commercial um, residential or others just moving to the county even in apartment complexes because it can ebb and flow in, in that aspect and demand that's placed on the infrastructure because right now we're, we're, we're sitting in a spot where it's it's used for those particular things but to your point that you mentioned when you bring up public safety yeah you know, it's not something that we can can use that funding for right now and obviously more residential homes more commercial businesses have a, as we've already seen a um, over the last several years, a, a massive impact on emergency services, which, of course, last budget cycle we had to address. So when, when you start spreading that burden over the entire um, county, when it, commercial or residential, I think you see a greater impact and people get a better return on their investment. Um, that's why I'm looking forward to seeing, or I'll probably still see it, but I won't be uh, making a decision on it, um, what comes of this um, and how it's actually going to truly impact the overall portion of the county. And I guess what that comes down, are, are you going to be offering beyond the policy decisions that I see here um, any framework for how that money can be used in the different considerations, whether it's emergency services or, like you said, the the, uh, the back payment of infrastructure. Are you going to offer any framework from other jurisdictions that show how they apply that with the excise tax? Um, I, th I think I understand what you're saying. I mean, typically what we would do is show what your rates are compared to peer communities, and they would be separated out so that let's just say the tax is a dollar that 33 percent goes to public safety 20 cents goes to schools etc right. um, but I don't I mean in terms of how the other jurisdictions apply it it's 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 going to be an apples to apples sort of comparison where you say you know Calvert County their road tax is X compared to yours being Y yeah, I think what I'm what I'm getting at is more getting away from the tri county area. There always seems to be a comparison as to what Charles does or what right. Calvert does, and you know, it, it, either way, it's exhausting with that. But w looking nationally as to what the excise tax does and those model policies. So when we're talking about a detention center cost fifteen million dollars, what did uh, you know Detroit do? What did um, you know some other uh, jurisdiction out on the West Coast do to? put a policy in place that says we're going to enact this and then this is how we're going to take care of that debt service moving forward. Uh, similar to what Commissioner Hewitt said, uh, is the new taxpayer paying for the previous uh, model and how did they framework that out? Um, just something for us to work with or the next board or our, our finance to work with. Um, so it doesn't, you don't have to basically recreate the wheel is right. what I'm getting at. Right. Yeah. Your ordinance will, will have some of that, but we certainly have anecdotal information because yeah, we work all across the country um, about how other communities are doing it. And, and, you know, the, and, and I certainly understand, you know, wanting to, to expand the comparison to other peer communities, whether they're inside Maryland or outside Maryland. Uh, but, you know, one thing to keep in mind with these comparisons is they really are an apples to oranges kind of comparison because you have to footnote everything. So for instance, you know, your fee may or tax may be greater because this other county hasn't updated it in 10 years. 
and they should have adopted it at this rate, but they adopted it at 50%. Or public safety doesn't include, you know, detention, but yours does. I mean, there are all these different things out there, but we can certainly com compile that information for you. But you do tend to have to footnote it to, to make it an apples to apples comparison. Yeah, I, I think that would be good just for consideration of um, those that are sitting here and our staff to to see maybe it's pitfalls from other jurisdictions and how they implemented things or, you know, sure. just learning from it to say, okay, well, they did this. Maybe we no, should look at it a little I bit differently. tell you all about pitfalls. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Trying to avoid them is, is always great. So any of those uh, lessons learned, I think would be great to uh, include. I think where I'm getting at. Definitely. Yeah. Anyone else? Got anything any else? other questions? A good presentation. I appreciate it. Thank you. I got Look, one quick yeah, one for sure. you. I'm sorry. Uh, tell me, you talked about uh, commercial versus uh, residential, and we don't do commercial in, uh, excise taxes. Uh, you know, the thought process is they create jobs, they pay higher taxes on that piece of property. But tell me, um, are you seeing commercial excise taxes across the country or where you're? Yeah, actually. <clears throat> You should be charging non-residential impact fees because of equal protection issues. For what? You're one of the few communities that don't charge non-residential impact fees currently. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, again, we kind of look at it like, hey, they're bringing jobs. They pay higher tax rates on commercial property than they do on residential property. Well, we'll be interested in your results. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Well, thank you, Anything commissioners. Um, okay. Are there any other questions? Yeah, if you could leave a card, um, please. I know we got your contact information here, but if you could leave a business card. Sure. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we'll go ahead and we'll go from here and we'll start um, putting together a schedule. It's, you know, really based on, you know, the tasks that are involved and um, we'll get back to you and we'll keep you briefed. Um, we are planning a budget work session for CIP in November. So maybe we'll have a little bit of information or update at that time. Okay. Good. Excellent. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very Thanks much. For, uh, you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. See you again. Thank you, Carson. Thank you, Commissioner President Guy, and that concludes County Administrator time. Okay, well, we're gonna go right into Commissioner time and we'll start with Commissioner Hewitt today. Oh, thank you. Well, this past week we had our uh, bi-monthly OPEB LOSAP meetings where uh, we talk about our retirement uh, cost and how we're handling them. And as many people know, we've go we've switched uh, consultants. We've switched our policy on how we're uh, investing, and we've gone to a more conservative approach. Uh, many people may also know that the stock market has been in a, a tailspin. Uh, that's a good term to use. I'm not sure, but let's just say it's been very choppy, and there's been a lot of losses. Uh, the good news report is, uh, well, first, the bad news to report is we've had our share of losses. But the good news to report is it hasn't been as high as the uh, average that's going on across the nation. We are actually several points below what accounts are losing, what, what they're seeing happening in corrections in people's accounts. The other good news is, is we are still way above our uh, amount that we set as our goal to to, to raise to, for this to pay for itself, for these retirement uh, plans to uh, pay for themselves. And we are now taking money out of those plans and we're uh, actually putting it into the general fund. So we can put that money that we were putting away for retirement, we can now start using it for taxpayer uh, benefits or whatever we wanna do in that regard. The other thing we're doing is, is instead of, uh, we just recently uh, put $3 million towards low SAP, that was something we did with last year's budget, but instead of come July 1st, we put it all in, no, we decided that what we would do is put a quarter in each quarter, actually 750,000 each quarter, and see how the market goes. It gives us an opportunity, as they say, to buy low, but we ha I don't think the markets are really found the bottom. I know all this is not very interesting, it's not very sexy, as we say, but it, it, it's your money, and it's important how we invest it, how we return it, and that we make sure we're doing a good job, and I'm happy to report uh, we're doing better than a lot of others. Uh, animal shelter this afternoon at two o'clock. 
Again, I mentioned it last week, I'll mention it again. Uh, brand new animal shelter coming online. Uh, for anybody who's been here any length of time or for anybody who's had to deal with the animal shelter, driving to Hughesville, then driving out 231 almost at a Benedict Bridge, uh, that has always been an inconvenient thing to citizens of St. Mary's County. And having one down in the California area, which will be equidistant whether you live in Charlotte Hall or Ridge or in that central part of the county makes it good for all of us. <coughs> um, got a critical areas commission meeting next Wednesday. And what we're gonna do there is St. Mary's County is proposing that we uh, not lift, but we allow uh, pools to be constructed in the 100 foot buffer. Now, at the last critical area commission meeting I was at over a month ago, uh, they talked about they're gonna oppose every single one. So it's kind of, and I'm, uh, it's going to be interesting to see how that discussion goes, because if you are lifting a uh, use that you could not do and you're saying you can't apply, there's the, uh, I think it's reasonable to think you can get approved. But Critical Area Commission has always said they're going to disapprove everyone. But it's about not being more restrictive than the straight state requirements, which I agree with. We should not be more restrictive. But this is gonna be an interesting uh, discussion with uh, people who believe that there shouldn't be any in the uh, 100 foot buffer, there shouldn't be any pools in there, but you should be allowed to ask. I mean, if you're only gonna be told no, why do it? So it'll be interesting and I'll report that next time. Lastly, uh, tomorrow's my daughter's Christina's 39th birthday. And as we all know, women quit at 39. And maybe they quit earlier, I don't know, but I know she's tomorrow's be her last birthday. But you'll always be Papa's baby girl. Happy birthday. <laughs> Eric, you Very good. So last Friday, I was fortunate enough to be able to attend the RSVP, the Retired Senior and Volunteer Program Awards Ceremony, where we recognize volunteers from a lot of different areas in the county um, and for all the work that they do, the hours that they accumulate throughout the year. Um, just a, a really great ceremony, very well done, and it was uh, very interesting and a lot of fun. So I was thankful to be there. And then over the weekend on Saturday, I was fortunate enough to be able to go down and see the new Maryland Duck. Um, so if you are looking for something to do, especially as we get into some cooler weather in the fall, go down and visit historic St. Mary City and see all that's going on there and check out the new Dove that they had built. It was absolutely incredible. It was a lot of fun. It was a really great time. So um, it was very good. There's a lot of stuff going on in the calendar. My calendar's filled up a lot. I know everybody's got a lot going on. But another event coming up, if you're looking for something fun, this Saturday, the town of Leonardtown is doing their first annual sidewalk art contest down at the wharf and it's open to everyone any age any skill level and there's going to be competitions but it's going to be a lot of fun so you can go down there and they'll provide some sidewalk chalk and sidewalk paint and stuff and decorate it out starts at 10 a.m so a lot of fun stuff is going on in st mary's county there's plenty to do thank you john you got it next uh, so i want to talk a little bit about the uh, proclamation for national suicide prevention month um you know it's it's not just about the month, it's all year. I made mention of it with Dr. Brewster about our veteran population, losing 22 veterans uh, a day. Uh, it is pervasive, it is an epidemic, it is uh, something that as a society I believe we need to work harder on. And, and it's not just about stopping suicide, I, I truly believe that it's about recognizing the symptoms thereof. It's about um, working from every single aspect to identify those that are the, at the greatest risk. Um, you know, I focus on the veteran community, being a veteran, uh, having lost friends uh, to suicide after they return from war. And uh, I know the impact that it has on their families, their friends, and the, uh, the places uh, when talking to my friends, the dark places they've been. So I think that if you know somebody, and I, I, I say this every year, um, please reach out to them. If you ever think that maybe I should just give this person a call, maybe I should just send a text message, uh, maybe I should just show up at their house and knock on the door. Um, trust your gut, because sometimes it's those small things that can help save somebody's life and then know where to go from there. You know, we have, uh, 
new systems for suicide prevention that are coming online where it's not just the 800 number. Um, there, there's a three digit, and unfortunately I don't know the exact three digit that they're launching now. Um, and, and of course, if in the worst case scenario, you can always call 911 and they will help locate somebody that you believe may be a threat to themselves. Um, Commissioner Morgan uh, worked uh, very closely on the idea of nets on the bridge with the Tri-County and got help get that pushed up to, uh, you know, Annapolis to, to help study that. And the critics of, of nets, well, look, it's a prevention measure. If it can help save a life, yeah, you know, that's great. And the argument that somebody may do it some other way, well, if we can grab a moment in time where there is a, a sense of reality, a sense of clarity to intercede, that may be that moment that that person needs. So something that's very important and it surrounds us all the time there are always people that are struggling with mental health so just keep that in mind as, as you go out your day and um, when you're also interacting with people and I think as Commissioner President Guy would say you know be kind be kind be nice. you know that, that that one moment you never know could could change that person's day um, got a question from a citizen in reference to schools it was funny we were talking about the impact fee and the question was when are we going to get new schools that that are free of mold and, and other issues and no expandables. Well, what I would say is uh, this board, previous boards, has worked diligently on infrastructure and schools, uh, provided the schools with the funding that they need to go ahead and enhance those projects. But ultimately, your question is best directed at the Board of Education as they plan out their capital improvements and what schools they will need and, and how they're going to proceed forward to that. And then the commissioners consider that. And these, the, at least the last two boards have uh, signed off with, on all those plans and projects for the Board of Education. So um, please focus on the infrastructure from the Board of Education when it comes to schools, expanding students and, and everything there and understand that the commissioners have been very supportive of the capital improvements and I think you, you heard Commissioner Hewitt say um, 17, roughly $17 million to renovating schools. And uh, to make the rounds, Commissioner Colvin did not say what day it was. I did not. He didn't. But I mentioned every other commissioner, so I had to get him in. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, thank you, Commissioner O'Connor. Um, I also attended the RSVP luncheon last Friday. It was really good. Ladies and gentlemen uh, were there. We had it at the University of System of Maryland, Southern Maryland campus. Again, a big plug. If you haven't been out there, go take a look at it in the airport. We encourage the seniors who are there to look at also, but more importantly, the thousands and thousands of hours that those seniors have dedicated to serving the community, not only for the ladies at our luncheon table who made masks, but all the other projects they do along the way. The Dove was a great event down there on Saturday. That um, project, in case you didn't know it, the Dove was built about 1978, 1979, and it was supposed to have a 20-year lifespan, and it's now up to 40. So <laughs> under the guidance of former Senator Miller, a $5 million grant was put forth to build the new Dove, and the Dove was brought over. And as Commissioner Coleman says, go down, take a look at it. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, this Friday is first Friday in Leonardtown. Um, there will be a mural and a walkway dedication. I can't remember which one it was, but uh, a lot of things to do up there. Um, lastly, Labor Day weekend, last full weekend of the summer. Please be safe. Have a good time. Um, fall is just around the corner. Um, and with that, you all have a nice weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. <clears throat> I'm sorry I missed the RSVP. It's, uh, he's my favorite program every year, but uh, I went to Vermont this weekend to a, a wedding of my nephew, uh, Nick, who is Michael Guy's son, one and only son. And a uh, very great trip. Unfortunately, it was a nine and a half hour drive back yesterday. <laughs> that's a long drive. And that's in the southern part. Uh, for those of you who are up in sort of around the, uh, the Snow Mountain uh, area, uh, well, they call them mountains, but they're only about six, 7,000 feet at the highest. But uh, very nice trip, beautiful country up there and everything, but it's very sparsely populated compared to even us down here. I mean, it's a uh, very low population around the area, but it was a beautiful uh, event. We went to uh, Robert Todd Lincoln's uh, summer home on about a 300 acre piece of land, probably about 10,000 square foot house that he built up there, but it was a beautiful, beautiful location venue for a wedding. So we had a, we had a good time. Uh, I'd like to also say uh, that uh, 
uh, as Commissioner uh, O'Connor said, nice does matter. We need to be treating everybody nice nowadays. And uh, unfortunately, my time in service to you know, after 26 years, I do uh, know of people that had uh, rough times adjusting, especially after a time in a war and everything. So uh, please respect that. And uh, we, we have we've come a long ways on treating mental health. Uh, in the past, we didn't. We sort of. Uh, rejected as being uh, something we don't want to talk about or even look at, but it's it's a real thing. And uh, some people can't adjust to certain aspects of life. And we need to respect that and try to help them give them a little treatment. So uh, as, we, as Commissioner Khan said, I always say it, nice matters. And we need to continue doing that. Uh, at this time, I'd like to go ahead and let you know that uh, we have an outside event today, the, our St. Mary's Animal Adoption and Resource Center ribbon cutting uh, at 2 p.m. It's at 22975 FDR Boulevard, Lexington Park. It's right behind uh, where the giant food and uh, uh, behind there is a, some Navy housing back. It's right behind that on FDR Boulevard uh, where Lowe's, that whole complex there is. So if you got a little bit of time today at 2 o'clock, come on by and, uh, and see what we, we put out here. This is a great resource for the people of St. Mary's County. You have to travel all the way to Benedict to to look at animals and adopt, and we're, we're hoping that will bring a great resource to us here. Uh, with that in sign, I'd get a motion to go into closed session. I move to enter into closed session for the purpose of discussing real property. Second. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any nays? Ayes have it. Thank you very much, everybody.